church, and so um, I know a few things, like where washrooms are, but I'll be up front. So if you have any questions, there's usually some folks near the back. If you're a visitor or this is your first or second time, um, we want you to feel comfortable in this space. So um, yeah, if somebody's smiling at you, they're probably a good person to ask for help. <laughs> um, we, I have a couple announcements before we jump into worship. The first one is about an event coming up next week. And uh, Lonesome Beach Camp, which you've heard me talk about, I don't know, like every time I get the opportunity. Um, Lonesome Beach Camp is our United Church Camp. It's just north of the city. And it is running a fundraising dinner next Sunday evening, August 27th. And uh, it's called The Last Supper. And the reason it's called that is because this is the last meal that will be held in our beloved dining hall before it's demolished on August 29th. And so if you have been to the camp, and I uh, haven't seen that building in a few years. Uh, this is a great opportunity to go eat pizza. And it's nothing fancy. It's not even compared to the dining hall because um, things will already be starting to be moved out of that space. Um, and also donate some money to the rebuilding of the dining hall, which, you know, for demolishing, it's, it's happening. It's, it's going to be taking place um, all through the winter and hopefully be done by next June. Um, we still have a few hundred thousand dollars left to go to fundraise for the completion of the project. And so there'll be funny opportunities to share your abundance with the camp, like auctioning off the first sledgehammer swing through a wall. Um, I think there's a like three foot tall potato masher that's on auction. Um, yeah, so if you need that, <laughs> um, nobody does. Anyway, so this is a really weird night full of camp silliness. So if uh, you'd like to go out, I encourage you to do so. And um, Cecilia, was there a link to the tickets in the... I just put it in the Facebook comments, it's, and it'll be in the bulletin tomorrow. Awesome. It's, the, bullet, the email that will come out tomorrow will have a link to tickets, and also if you watch this on Facebook later, I don't know, or if you're on Facebook, you can click, click the link, and anyway, it's on Facebook. Um, I also wanted to just to let everyone here know, for folks who uh, have spent time with Evelyn Gay, she is in the hospital right now at Pioneer Village. Um, she's, she's doing better, um, but she is very open to your prayers and to your visits. And so, um, Liz, if you, if, you, uh, if you know everyone, you know Liz. <laughs> um, she has more information, so you can, um, if you'd like to pop in and say hi to Evelyn, um, you can talk to Liz to get details on that. And finally, I'd like to invite Barbara up here. My name is Barbara Sharunas, and I'm the chair of the board, relatively new in that position. Cecilia Rand has been our communications coordinator for over a year now. She's the one that sends out the weekly announcements. She looks after our website and our Facebook page and our Instagram page. Who knew that we had one? <laughs> <laughs> and she's the one that looks um, after the live streaming of our Sunday worship services each week. It takes her three hours every Sunday morning to do that. There's lots more involved than you would think. You'll see her sitting here on the front row, often with her daughters, Elizabeth and Evelyn. Could you guys stand up? <laughs> so here they are. Anyway, the CEO has a, uh, resigned from her position as communications coordinator, and today is her last day. So today we say goodbye to Cecilia and to thank her for her good work.
Fear God, would you blow again into our lives, moving us to action where we have grown stagnant and break down the walls that we build that separate us, where our words divide all our translation, where our fear overcomes, fill us with the fire of courage, where our lives are stalled, fill our sails with wind, moving us forward into the unknown future. O God of wind and whisper, O God of roaring flame and flickering candle, would you fill us once again with the hope and promise of Pentecost. Amen. And now we'll take a moment to share the peace of Christ with each other. If you would like, you can stand up and shake hands with those around you. If you'd rather just stay seated, seated you know, make eye contact and smile at anybody near you. And, and you can call and respond with, may the peace of Christ be with you all. And then also with you. Let us share peace with one another.
Right, that's great. But I just wanted to check in with some kiddos about how their summer's going. Yeah, how are you doing? I know you've been here lots, but I'm kind of new up front. How are you doing? Have you had a good summer? No? <laughs> oh, okay. Well, we can talk about that later if you want. Do <laughs> you miss school? Yeah, okay, I get that. Have you had a good summer? Yeah? Awesome. Have you, have you done anything exciting? Did you go to school or like go to camp here in the summer? You went camping? Nice. In a tent or a trailer or a cabin? All of them? <laughs> Sweet. You're lucky. <laughs> that sounds awesome. Um, how would you guys been here? Have you had a good summer? Yeah? Um, I, I, I know you both pretty well, so I actually know something that you both did this summer that I'm going to... Yeah, so you both went to Longton Beach Camp. I told you, give me a mic, I'm going to talk about Longton Beach Camp. You went to LBC. Did you kids go to Longton Beach Camp? Now? No? Have you ever been to an overnight summer camp? Okay, well, listen in. You have? Yeah, okay, cool. <laughs> You've done it all. Um, awesome, well, listen in if you want to any uh, tidbits, because this was Evelyn's first year going to camp, right? Okay, Evelyn, how was it? Okay, what was one thing that made it very fun? The campfire. Oh, the campfire. So campfire is supposed to be kind of like a bit crazy, eh? What, what's something that happened there for folks who've never been? You don't know? Maybe. Well, listen, what's something that happens at a Lost Beach Camp campfire? We sing songs and tell stories. Nice. And some of the songs are pretty wild, right? Yeah. Uh, and Elizabeth, this was not your first year. How many, do you know how many summers you've been at Lexington? Six. This is your fifth year at camp. Nice. Did they do a Sango Circle? Did you hear a pin? Oh, because the camp has a tradition where campers who've been there for five years get a special pin and they're sort of welcomed into a circle it's called the Sango Circle. Okay, so what's your favorite part of camp? Make a different than camp. Okay, tell us a little sleep. So we got to sleep on tarps and a sleeping bag. We got to go to the special spot and we slept on the tarp. So you slept on a tarp under the stars? Under the stars. Mm -hmm. And what did you eat? Corn. <laughs> That's it for supper? <laughs> and lasagna. And lasagna. Lasagna. Campfire lasagna. Wow. That's very cool. And so you would probably recommend this camp to other children. <laughs> Has not stopped calling since I said I don't do it Wow. Cool. Does anybody have anything coming up still this summer that they're excited about? Because school doesn't start for another week. Do you have something you're excited about? No? Okay, I'll tell you mine. I still haven't been to Los Angeles Pool. I'm going to go. Okay. Well, anybody? Kathy? Oh, Kathy got some shit. Yeah. <laughs> this is really odd and really different. But a lot of people will say, Temptation, but deliver us from evil. 
for thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Thank you. So kiddos, if you want to stick around, awesome. If you want to check out the gym, that's an option. Good morning. I invite you to join with me in the prayer of understanding for the season of Pentecost that's found in your bulletin. Spirit of the living God, turn on the light of truth and wake up our hearts by the words we now declare and ponder. In ancient stories, let us find fresh life, fresh hope, and fresh courage for witness in your world. The first reading is a reading from the Hebrew Scriptures from the book of Isaiah, chapter 56, verse 1 and 6 to 8. Thus says the Lord, Maintain justice and do what is right, for soon my salvation will come and my deliverance be revealed. And the farmers who join themselves to the Lord to minister to him, to love the name of the Lord and to be his servants. All who keep the Sabbath and do not profane it, and hold fast my covenant. These I will bring to my holy mountain and make them joyful in my house of prayer. Their burnt offerings and their sacrifices will be accepted on my altar. For my house shall be called a house of prayer for all people. Thus says the Lord God, who gathers the outcasts of Israel. I will gather others to them besides those already gathered. Our second reading from the Christian scriptures is from the book of Matthew, chapter 15, and verses 10 to 28. Then he called the crowd to him and said to them, Listen and understand. It is not what goes into the mouth that defiles the person, but it is what comes out of the mouth that defiles. Then the disciples approached and said to him, Do you know that the Pharisees took offense when they heard what you said? He answered, Every plant that my heavenly Father hath not planted will be uprooted. Let them alone. They are blind, guides of the blind. And if one blind person guides another, both will fall into a pit. But Peter said to him, Explain this parable to us. Then he said, Are you also still without understanding? Do you not see that whatever goes into the mouth enters the stomach and goes out into the sewer? But what comes out of the mouth proceeds from the heart. And this is what he wants. For out of the heart come evil intentions, murder, adultery, fornication, theft, false witness, slander. These are what defile a person. But to eat with unwashed hands does not defile. Jesus left that place and went away to the district of Tyre and Sidon. Just then, a Canaanite woman from that region came out and started shouting, Have mercy on me, Lord, son of David. My daughter is tormented by a demon. But he did not answer her at all. And his disciples came and urged him, saying, Send her away, for she keeps shouting after us. Whoa. 
He answered, I was sent only to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. But she came and knelt before him, saying, Lord, help me. He answered, It is not fair to take the children's food and throw it to the dogs. She said, Yes, Lord. Yet even the dogs eat the crumbs that fall from their master's table. Yeah. Then Jesus answered her, Woman, great is your faith. Let it be done for you as you wish. And her daughter was healed instantly. May God's blessing be upon these and all words spoken and pondered here this morning. Amen. Thank you, Julia, for giving voice to today's reading. So, some of you folks know, because I've um, guest preached here before, that I have the privilege of working for the United Church of Canada in the area of stewardship, education, and support. I get to work alongside communities of faith all across Western Canada, and through my work I get to dream about ways to inspire deeper generosity and to cultivate gratitude. And most of the time, I really love my work and it's really joyful. But I should be clear that there are many, many congregations right now with a lot of fear and grief about their futures. Many times I get to sit with groups and discuss some hard stuff, like shrinking membership, few or no children, decreased offerings, and difficult decisions to sell buildings or reduce staff or cut programs. And I also get to hope with them. That's actually my work. And I use hope as a verb, not just a passive emotion. Hoping alongside people means setting goals, creating a plan, and of course believing that success is possible. And I didn't make that up. Um, I got hope as a verb in from researcher and educator Bernie Brown, and she spells it all out in her book, um, The Gifts of Imperfection, which you should read if you haven't. It's really good. So when I hope with folks, which means I goal set and plan, and that you feel the spirit's movement in our work, I often coach around some pretty well-accepted rules regarding church stewardship. The conventions are the same I follow when I work for Lonson Beach Camp and when I work for other charitable nonprofits. Things like stay positive and speak to different groups of people differently and personally when possible, and don't be afraid to ask for money. So when I heard that there is a United Church minister, um, someone who I actually attended youth events with uh, like almost 20 years ago, uh, that she wrote a book that challenges many stewardship conventions. I really wanted to read it. Um, and it's called, and so I bought it, and I brought it. <laughs> it's called Serving Money, Serving God. Aligning Radical Justice, Christian Practices, and Church Life by Cheryl Johnson. And it's actually been my summer read. Um, other than one of my summer reads. <laughs> Okay, so when Liz asked me if he's going to help with worship today, I read the lectionary scriptures and I couldn't help but see how Cheryl's reflection links so nicely to the story of Jesus and the Canaanite woman. Cheryl questions what it means when churches talk about wealth and other advantages as blessings. She challenges some modern assumptions that church leaders should stay positive all the time and only tell stories about growth. And she unpacks some church conventions and practices that are rooted in white supremacy and in economic privilege. So what about those, that story, the story that Julia just shared with us? Before this faithful, nameless woman enters the story, Jesus is frustrated by his disciples, again, for not picking up the piece of them down. In the passage that immediately precedes the story, Jesus responds to challenges from the scribes and Pharisees by reframing the boundaries of clean and unclean. Then Jesus declares, what comes out of the mouth proceeds from the heart, and what comes out of the heart determines what makes one clean. Not just washing hands or preoccupation rituals, Jesus is challenging some major social conventions for his time. 
those time-tested behaviors for right living, and the standards by which we judge the correctness of somebody's behavior. And most of the time, probably in Jesus' day, same as ours today, we don't even explicitly name the convention. For example, in this community of faith, if someone were to jump up, like right now, or like during a prayer, and give me an amen, that would maybe be like an uncomfortable moment. No one said you can't do it, but shouting and turning amen is not a bad thing, actually. I would probably feel flattered. <laughs> um, but participation in places not outlined in our beautiful bulletin kind of runs against our social conventions here at Nottingham. However, there is a, it is a problem with social conventions, that they are, by definition, a little conservative. They're closed, they're static, and they're a tad un unimaginative. And therefore, while conventions maintain wisdom from past experience, they will also inevitably collide with the ongoing dynamic, open creativity of God. Or, as Isaiah put it, social conventions are human wisdom, they're not God wisdom. We can probably think, each of us, of dozens of places we have seen conventions change in our lifetime, too. Whether it's words that used to be common and are now impolite or downright offensive, or the expectation around the roles of women and men and how they play their part in family life, workplaces, even church, or the idea that gender is even a binary, commonplace for folks to be in our communities that have fluid gender, transgender, or no gender at all. Even small, less meaningful changes have taken place, like taking your hat off indoors. When I was young, teachers, camp leaders, parents, um, you know, people at church would certainly insist on the removal of a hat when you're inside. But nowadays, you, it would, you can wear a hat anywhere. It's fine. Those big, meaningful changes, not the hat, in social conventions, within church may have been hard won, or they may still be in process, but they point to times when we are open to the creative push of God, when we let go of the but it's always been this way and allow for a change of heart. Children receiving communion, women being ordained, the strengthening of lay worship leaders, the apology for our participation in residential schools, the publishing of new hymnals, the development of the firm united, the United Church of Canada does not live under the same social conventions that we did 90 years ago. All of us, and those active in this denomination before us, have had our hearts changed a hundred times, and they will probably keep changing in big and small ways. But back to our story with Jesus. So we hear from him about how our faith matters more than following social conventions, and then almost instantly we're sort of whisked away to Canaan, and a non-Israelite, i.e. an unclean woman, asks for help. At first, Jesus ignores her. She persists. The disciples turn her away. She keeps following them. And Jesus is like, no, I'm here for my lost sheep, not you. And she keeps after them. And Jesus even makes a pretty harsh comparison of her people being dogs. The woman, however, is not deterred. She claims a place in the household, but not a position of privilege. She accepts the status of family dog claiming that even dogs enjoy crumbs from the table. And her statement is striking because she places hope in what others have discarded. It is a statement of abundance. She's saying that Jesus has so much power or love or grace that there's enough for the house of Israel and more than enough left over for her. She's not trying to thwart his mission. She just wants crumbs. So even as an outsider with a sick daughter, she sees abundance. This reminds me of some of the congregations I have hoped with. Maybe they are speaking in a conventional sense, fewer people, less money, but instead of doing nothing, or infighting, or giving up, they hope. They set their goals, they make a plan. They believe in their capacity to do good in the lives of the worshiping community and beyond. They may even have placed hope in what others have discarded, like the Canaanite woman. Maybe they offer services to the wider community by opening up their buildings, or 
people by selling their real names, they get creative. And it's through the Canaanite women and her faith that Jesus does a 180. Maybe he realizes that she's speaking from her heart, something that just a couple sentences before he told everyone was really important. Maybe he remembers that Isaiah said, God's house of prayer is for all people. Or maybe he saw in her heart this unwavering, nagging, persistent care for her daughter and her unwavering, nagging, persistent trust that Jesus can cure her daughter from deep faith. Bottom line, it, changed, uh, it caused a change of heart in Jesus. Everyone is capable of opening up to what others have said and seeing in their context and allowing their heart to be changed. So I want to share a little change of heart, or a change of heart I have recently. Um, as I mentioned, my work focuses on getting communities of faith to encourage generosity, mostly from individuals and households. Getting people to share their abundance, including their time and their talents, but focus on large parts of money. And I think that sharing is actually really important. I believe in paying taxes, donating to charities, and providing mutual aid, communities is kind of what's going to get us through, um, get humanity through, and essential climate change, massive wealth disparity, and many other social crises that we find ourselves in right now. In lots of ways, I think that change starts at the individual or household level, and sharing our money with each other, with the work of the church, with mission and service, and with other charitable organizations in our community is vitally important to being human, and especially being before my change of heart, I really thought if we could all become more generous, just things would get better. And so for the past two years, I have been doing this work with congregations. I keep giving kind of the same message. Talk to your members. Talk to people who value your mission or your building. Speak to individuals from where they're coming from. Share the good news about all the amazing work your church is doing. Stay positive. Talk about growth, etc. Um, but the bottom line is, Get money from people. Get people to volunteer. Get individuals to share. But the thing is, I kept bumping into communities of faith for who, for no fault of their thrift shift or their own, they were in crisis mode, in the brink of closing. These congregations were sometimes rural and felt the decline of rural population really impact them. Some of these congregations were young, actually younger congregations, planted in the suburbs in the 1980s or 1990s, many of whom are still paying off mortgages, or their churches in neighborhoods just outside of downtown that have demographics that have shifted. Many of their congregations um, now are what we call new Canadians or are filled with people that are lower income. Across the country, many, maybe even most, United Church Communities of Faith are experiencing a decrease in givers, and an aging volunteer base, and a general decline in membership. However, these challenges are not experienced the same way. It didn't sit easy with me. I hate to see a church, a suburban church, let's say, with an average of 30 kids on a Sunday, doing amazing family ministry, having to choose how to reorganize and reduce staffing to meet budget. Or, or seeing the only United Church within a four-hour drive in a rural area have to reduce worship to one or two Sundays a month. Or notice even in our city, how there are no congregations left in North Central, or Heritage, or Rosemont, or Eastview. There was something just deeper bugging me that I couldn't quite put my finger on. Then Cheryl Cook, serving money, serving God, she articulated some of this point. She explained that it's not just about individuals being generous and sharing their abundance. It's actually about churches seeing the world as abundant and sharing it as well. And they're recognizing the privilege that some communities of faith hold and being aware of that. So right now, the United Church moderator, Carmen Lansdowne, is talking a lot about affordable flourishing. There's a new book club you can join starting in September. There's leadership training. There's all sorts of things. It's this flourishing project, and you can Google it now if you want it after worship. It would be nice. <laughs> um, I love the idea of flourishing. I think it's a great word. And actually, I naturally lean towards optimism. 
And so this idea really speaks to me. I want our denomination to flourish. And I, but I don't think it's possible for us to be an anti-racist church, which we've said we want to be, to be a church focused on growth and on justice, two key objectives in the denominational strategic plan right now, without acknowledging the massive divisions of wealth and privilege among communities of faith. And communities of faith are the grassroots of this denomination. It's a drive to the convention to pretend that everything is okay in stewardship, focus on growth, talk about what's going well, but like Cheryl Johnson challenges, when we do that, we miss the opportunity for deeper community engagement and honest wrestling with the complex realities and difficult emotions. When we ignore that some churches, often in wealthier and whiter neighborhoods, have large reserves, while other churches and ministries fade away, we are missing the opportunity to have meaningful conversations about disparity and justice and what flourishing in our denomination actually looks like. As the United Church of Canada, we can't be growth-oriented and anti-racist if we pretend that everything's fine, and some churches' privilege is a blessing, and some churches' struggles are God's will. Christianity doesn't exist to just keep existing. We don't spend an hour together on Sundays talking about just being here. We have all these buildings, and these camps, and these community ministries, and these prison chaplaincies, and these hospital chaplaincies and retreat centers and housing complex and a zillion other things that our denomination does that are all expressions of our call to seek justice, love kindness, and walk humbly. Isaiah reminds us that God's house of prayer is for all people. Jesus remembers he has enough for Israel and beyond. The Spirit is dynamic and creative, pushing us outside the social conventions of every church, social conventions of every church for themselves, and into a place of truth making and abundance. As individuals, as a community of faith, as a denomination, and beyond, we're all capable of having a change of heart. Remembering that we speak truth and wrestle with privilege and pain and hope alongside each other. We are never alone. God is with us. Thanks be to God. And now, if you'd like to join me, we're going to read together the new creed of the United Church, which is printed on the back of your bulletin. We are not alone. We live in God's world. We believe in God, who has created and is created. Who has come in Jesus, the Word made flesh, to reconcile and make new, who works in us and others by the Spirit. We trust in God. We are called to be the church, to celebrate God's presence, to live with respect in creation, to love and serve others, to seek justice and resist evil, to proclaim Jesus crucified and risen our judge and our hope. In life, in death, in life beyond death, God is with us. We are not alone. Thanks be to God. So we witness the holy mystery that is holy love. God is creative and self giving <coughs> generously moving in all the near and distant corners of the universe. Nothing exists that does not find its source in God. Our first response to God's providence is gratitude. We sing thanksgiving. And we share our gifts now, which will be collected.
we pray. We live abundant lives, blessed with so much. We offer what we can for God's dream, including those lived out through this church. Bountiful God, accept these our seeds of hope for the healing of the world. May the harvest be plentiful. O oh God, we pray. Amen. And now we come together and sing once again the voices united 376, Spirit of the Living God. We pray for an 
We are in the midst of enormous change and conflict as a community of faith as we navigate the departure of CAM, the search for new leadership, the directive to an external review, and the ever present need to show up and claim our mission. We ask for grace. Our hearts open for our church's leaders during a difficult time, sending them compassion as they build the road we are walking. We pray that they respond to these challenges with abundance and hearts open. As individuals and as a community, we ponder our response. We ask you to hear our prayers. In the silence, we name our own prayers for ourselves, for people we love, the communities we're a part of, and this world we all share. Silence for our own prayers.
look closer, and you will see this blessing is not finished, that you are a part of the path that is preparing. You are how this blessing means to be a voice in the wilderness and a welcome to the way. Go in peace, in love.